Tonight, high temperatures help create a perfect storm for spreading wildfires. You have a lot of uncertainty, you have a lot of fear, you have, you know, it's just a lot to take in. The latest on the nationwide heat wave and western wildfires. Plus, we are being very transparent, probably giving updates several times a day about how the president's doing. An update on President Biden's bout with COVID and reopening old wounds. A lot of them died. Some of them probably died from broken heart. The national investigation into a Montana boarding school for Native Americans. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. High temperatures fueling the flames of wildfires in the United States. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. In Washington, I'm Abigail Robertson. On the East Coast, sweltering conditions have communities on high alert, some bracing for the longest heat wave in nearly a decade. Meanwhile, high temps and drought-like conditions are fueling wildfires out west. That's right. The extreme weather can be described as oppressive or stifling, but it's also downright dangerous. CBN's Brody Carter is following the situation in tonight's top story. Brody, are forecasters seeing any let up? Unfortunately, not anytime soon. John Abigail from Texas to Maine, some 90 million Americans are sweating through dangerously hot temperatures, and it's expected to last throughout the week. In just three days, flames from the Oak Fire in Mariposa County, California, have burned more than 16,000 acres and threatens part of the prized Yosemite National Park. The blaze is already one of the state's largest fires this year. Smoke is so thick and pervasive, it's visible from the International Space Station. We're hoping for the best because we don't know yet if the house is there. On the ground, the blaze has taken out roughly 10 structures, while thousands more are being threatened. Close to 4,000 residents have evacuated their homes. Firefighters say a mix of high temps, low humidity, strong winds and dry vegetation contributed to the speed and intensity of the fire. With only 10% of the blaze contained, Governor Gavin Newsom has declared a state of emergency. It's just too hot. Yeah, it's just way too hot. While conditions are rough in western states, the heat has an even tighter grip on some 90 million Americans from Texas to Maine. New Jersey saw five straight days of 100-degree weather. As I'm sitting here sweating, <laughs> sweat's pouring down. <laughs> and, the sun, and the sunscreen's going in my eyes. In New York, the annual triathlon scaled down to just half the distance, with runners being urged to hydrate. Heat forced organizers to postpone Boston's race until next month, after the city hit a daily record of 100 degrees Sunday, the hottest since 1933. As president, I have a responsibility to act with urgency and resolve when our nation faces clear and present danger. And that's what climate change is about. President Biden and a number of scientists blaming the situation on global warming and declaring a code red for humanity. Human influence is making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts, more frequent and severe. We are facing a combination of worsening impacts on land and in the ocean and along our coasts, including a significant increase in the frequency and intensity of weather and climate extremes. After a sweltering weekend, the Pacific Northwest is expecting a heat wave next. There are several heat watches that have potential to be upgraded to heat warnings into next week. Abigail, John, back to you. All right. Important to stay cool and say thank you, Brody. Well, we have an update tonight on President Biden's COVID diagnosis. The 79-year-old symptoms are nearly gone, and he's said to be recovering well. That description from the White House physician. Though Mr. Biden is still dealing with some nasal congestion and is a little hoarse. Today, while remaining socially distanced, the president did participate in a couple of virtual events. And as the president recovers at the White House on Capitol Hill, Senators Joe Manchin and Lisa Murkowski both tested positive today for COVID. And another member of Congress is also making headlines, drawing attention and pushback over a reported visit to Taiwan. China warning it will respond with strong measures if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi makes the trip, possibly even including military action. National security correspondent Caitlin Burke joins us now with more. Caitlin, the Biden administration has suggested a delay. Meanwhile, some experts worry about caving to the demands of the Chinese Communist Party. What's the significance behind Pelosi's potential visit?
Abigail John, a trip to Taiwan would be the first by a sitting House speaker in 25 years when then Speaker Newt Gingrich visited the island. As second in line for the presidency, Pelosi's presence would send a strong signal of support for Taiwan's independence. I think that it's important for us to show support uh, for Taiwan. I also think that we have, none of us has ever said we're for independence when it comes to Taiwan. That's up to Taiwan to decide. While Pelosi has not confirmed a visit, initial reports suggested an August timetable. And President Biden himself recently indicated the speaker should wait. I think that the military thinks it's not a good idea right now. but. Uh, I don't know what the status of it is. Over the weekend, Joint Chiefs Chairman Mark Milley warned that China's military has become significantly more aggressive and dangerous over the past five years. But experts say it's unlikely the Pentagon would ask the speaker to cancel a trip. We're going to have to absorb some kind of negative reaction from the Chinese, probably be worse than previous periods. But we can't imagine that it's going to be you know, war. Some concerned over the timing of a visit cite August as being the anniversary of the founding of the People's Liberation Army. There's also an important decision in November when the ruling Communist Party is expected to grant President Xi Jinping an unprecedented third term. Walter Lohman, director of the Heritage Foundation Asian Studies Center, points out there will never be a time frame when the CCP supports an official U.S. visit to Taiwan, and President Xi has nothing to prove. He's in a very strong position within the party. He's about to get his third term, and he's put a down payment on a fourth term. He's consolidating power within the CCP. Uh, I don't see him as weak at all. Uh, you know, I don't see him having to demonstrate anything. The Biden administration, on the other hand, can't afford to show weakness. And Lohman says that would be the message if Pelosi cancels her trip. First of all, it, it puts a lie to what we tell the Chinese all the time. That is that we have you know, divided government in the United States. We have co-equal branches uh, of government and the president of the United States can't make the Speaker of the House go or not go. She, it's up to her. The second message it sends, and this, this one is, is really one that will be heard loud and clear in the region, is that there's a new sheriff in town. Chinese don't want us to go to Taiwan. They tell us don't go or we'll, you know, unspecified, uh, you know, cause you trouble or whatever. And the president of the United States convinces the speaker that not to go. President Biden has a phone call scheduled with President Xi in the coming weeks, and there's speculation that he's balking on Pelosi's trip out of concern the call will be canceled. Lohman says it's much more important in the long run that China understand it can't determine the parameters of U.S. foreign policy. Abigail, John. And we will be watching. Thank you so much, Caitlin. We'll hear now from more author, columnist, and speaker Gordon Chang. Gordon, welcome to Faith Nation. Uh, as we just heard in Caitlin's reporting, uh, a, a speaker of the United States House of Representatives hasn't visited Taiwan in a quarter of a century. What would a Pelosi trip mean? A Pelosi trip to Taiwan would show that the United States is not afraid of China. China has made this a test of wills with the comments that it's made both publicly and in private over the last week. And so I think at this particular time, unless the United States decides to submit to China on a number of things, because Beijing's not going to stop with just Pelosi's visit. So unless we're willing to submit to China, she has to go. She has now, I think, made this uh, an important element of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Well, Gordon, today Taiwan held air raid drills, which just so happened to come amid concerns over the possibility of Speaker Pelosi's visit. What message is Taiwan sending with these drills? Well, Taiwan, since um, the invasion of Ukraine, has put a lot more effort into civil defense. It's belated, of course, um, but this is a good sign. Um, the United States needs to spend a lot more time thinking about how to defend Taiwan and helping Taiwan to defend itself because we have kept Taiwan weak. Uh, we've done that for a number of reasons. I think that it's been misguided. But right now, whatever one thinks of prior policy, um, the situation across the strait is dangerously imbalanced with China building up its military very quickly and with Taiwan not keeping up. 
Gordon, you tweeted today, crises with China, whether over Taiwan or anything else, occur when China wants them. Is that what you see China is looking for in this situation? Yes, because Beijing has looked at the disarray in the Biden administration and thought that it could do what it wants, that it can determine outcomes in Washington. It started with the fall of Afghanistan. It also continued with the failure to deter Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine. And the Chinese, who generally think that we're done anyway, um, now have confirmation of that. So they have a very aggressive Chinese foreign policy establishment right now. But also, I think Xi Jinping has real problems at home. And so therefore, he has a lot of incentive right now to actually create some military misadventure abroad. Remember, he's accumulated all his power, as Walter Lohman just said. That means he's accumulated responsibility. Things are not going China's way. And Xi Jinping is being blamed for that. So I think that he could use a crisis right now. So real quickly here, uh, in about the 30 seconds we have left, do you think this trip will go on as planned? I really don't know. Um, there is disarray, obviously, in the Biden administration. Um, and, uh, you know, I just can't predict whether they'll do the right thing or not. I'm afraid that they will take the easy way out. They'll get Pelosi not to go. And we will hear many more demands from Beijing. This is not a good situation for us. Well, Gordon, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights today. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, John and Abby. Abortion in America, the latest estate lawmakers battle over potential bans next on Fake Nation. Welcome back to Faith Nation. Indiana is now ground zero in the abortion debate, drawing a strong in-person White House rebuke over a plan to ban nearly all abortions in the state. Vice President Kamala Harris's visit, time to the start of a special legislative session to debate a new Republican proposal. CBN's Tara Mergener joins us now. Tara, the GOP in the Hoosier state says the plan also includes a pledge to boost spending for pregnant women, young children, and adoptions. That's right, John. Republicans say the proposals show dedication to mothers and babies. Currently, abortion in Indiana is banned after 22 weeks of pregnancy. If passed, Indiana would join about a dozen other states banning abortion with some exceptions. Love thy neighbor doesn't mean just a person who looks like you, acts like you, or thinks like you. It means everyone. Indiana lawmakers encouraging decorum on a highly emotional issue. The state becomes one of the first Republican-led legislatures to debate tighter abortion laws following the Roe v. Wade decision last month outside the chamber support for the move. We are just obedient to God. We're supposed to stand up for those that can't speak for themselves. I believe that a baby in the womb is a person, and I believe in speaking up for life. And also against tougher restrictions in the state, banning nearly all abortions. Abortion is health care. Abortion saves lives. We respect the women's right to make their own decisions based on their own personal beliefs. The bill, which would allow exceptions in cases of rape, incest, or to protect a woman's life, is paired with $45 million set aside for state agencies that support the health of pregnant women, postpartum mothers, and infants. It also aims to increase access to pregnancy planning and contraception, especially among low-income families. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, there has been enormous focus around the country. As the spotlight shines on Indiana, Vice President Kamala Harris added to the attention. It should be that woman's decision, not the government telling her what to do with her body or her life. And no one has to give up their faith or their beliefs to agree that the government should not tell somebody else what they should do. Indiana lawmakers have through August 14th to finish their work during this special session. If the two chambers can't agree by then, time runs out on the legislation. Pro-life advocate Abby Johnson says this measure still does not go far enough. There's really no reason for these these bills to have rape and incest exceptions. What women who have been traumatized by sexual assault need is not to be further traumatized by abortion. They need care and counsel. 
At least 13 states have funneled roughly $495 million to crisis pregnancy centers since 2010, with Indiana coming in sixth. Texas is first, with more than $200 million directed toward its pregnancy centers. John and Abby. All right, thank you, CBN Senior White House uh, Washington correspondent, Darren Merger. A discovery of unmarked graves launches a national investigation over atrocities at a Native American boarding school in Montana. We travel there to bring you the details when Faith Nation returns. Welcome back to Faith Nation. I humbly beg forgiveness. That was Pope Francis's plea today in Canada. His visit there, an act of atonement for the Catholic abuse in the country. He's meeting with the indigenous community, apologizing for the church's treatment during the 18th and 19th centuries. More than 150,000 children were removed from their families and sent to church-run boarding schools where many suffered abuse. Indigenous people in Canada are seeking justice for those who suffered, as well as information on children who never returned home. Well, after 200 unmarked graves were discovered last year at a Canadian Native American boarding school, the United States decided to take action with the Secretary of Interior launching a national investigation into similar schools here. Mark Martin traveled to Montana to explore the devastating story playing out on both sides of the border. When he was a child, Blackfeet Nation member Wes Bremner attended the Cutbank Boarding School in northwestern Montana. As a second grader in the 60s, distance and harsh winters made it a necessity. The school environment proved harsh as well. Bremner says physical abuse started on day one when a staff member punched him. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. And I went against the wall. It was kind of wobbly on my feet. And... Uh, he said, now you go to bed, and it was about this time of day. Brimner is just one of many students who say they endured harsh corporal punishment and demeaning verbal abuse at indigenous boarding schools. And some came forward years later with allegations of sexual abuse. We asked Brimner if that ever happened to him. If I was, I would take it to my grave. And why is that again? It's the past. It's not something you would, uh... It's nobody's business. The boarding school where Bremner attended is still operational today. He says it's better run, and the abuse that took place when he was a student is unheard of. On the Flathead Reservation in Montana, indigenous boarding schools existed alongside St. Ignatius Mission. The Jesuit priest and pastor, Father Craig Hightower, says abuse happened at these schools as well. There was some sexual abuse, there's no question about it, um, and that's already been litigated in court. Uh, the majority of the abuses were uh, trying to take away their culture, uh, trying to assimilate them into the white world, uh, and the corporal punishment of the day. I mean, just the corporal punishment that was common at that time. All that is left of the original Ursuline Academy are the remains of this grotto that held a statue of Mary. Children ages preschool to high school gathered in a building that once stood on this property. Was it worse with the priests and the nuns? Maybe, maybe not. But that, those were the big controversies of, uh, of kids, you know, really being be beaten and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, that was part of the culture overall. According to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, more than 350 U.S. government-funded and many times church-run boarding schools operated in the 19th and 20th centuries. The movement started under the Indian Civilization Act of 1819 with the goal of assimilating indigenous children. Bremner says his mother was one of thousands of kids taken from their communities. He says at her school, there was a sign that read, kill the culture, save the child. Montana State Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy says while Crow tribe children weren't forcibly taken, the goal remained the same. Children weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, that was, and um, part of it was the hair was cut, especially with the boys uh, and the girls, their, their hair was cut. 
and then they were forced to move into the, the modern dress. The 2021 discovery of more than 200 unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada led Deb Holland, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, to launch a national investigation, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary, says her eight-year-old grandparents were taken from their families. She hopes the investigation will shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. A lot of them died. Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact with disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. And so what we want for our children is to help them to get to reconnect to who they are and to be strong and, and to have thriving nations. That's what we hope um, Deb Howland will be able to do, is to change the policy, educational policy, to provide empowerment. It's no strange thing for Native American communities not to trust the government, but um, to, to be able to create and to heal bonds within Native American communities and county governments, state governments, and the federal government, and um, to have that conversation so that we can move forward. Mark Martin, CBN News, Montana. Finally tonight, from amazing graffiti murals in New York to San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, the ingenuity of America can be seen across the country. One artist is making it his mission to capture America through art. Daniel Siddiqui just completed a year-long journey through 70 major cities, making handcrafted symbols of freedom and opportunity at each stop. From a surfboard in San Diego to glass blowing in Rhode Island, Daniel dialed into what each city is known for and created art to match. I just can't get enough of the country and exploring and wanting to connect with people and really explore their prides and passions and just kind of see their eyes light up when they're talking about their creation. In all, he created 70 pieces with the hope of helping people value what he calls the art that is America. You know, I didn't get a chance to see where all he visited, but I know Virginia Beach is your hometown. So yes. if you chose one thing to just highlight Virginia Beach, what would Mermaid. it be? Mermaid. Mermaid's all over. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks for watching, Faith Nation. We'll see you tomorrow.